conversations about gun violence in America tend to be bleak. Gun homicides kill over 11,000 Americans a year. It's about 30 a day. The worst cases, these mass shootings, prompt calls for stronger gun laws. But usually, nothing happens. So it's understandable why so many would feel nothing's going to change. But I'm here today to tell you that our, our level of violence will not stay the same. It will be going down. Violence is not ingrained necessarily into American culture nor into American law. It may surprise you, but when you compare the United States with other countries, other high-income countries, m most measures of violence show that we're average. We're average. But we stand out as a gross outlier when it comes to lethal violence. Our homicide rate's seven times higher than the average high-income country. Well, to many, this is explained by the fact we have a lot of guns. But it's not so simple. What I think lies at the heart of it is that our gun laws allow uh, too low a standards for legal gun ownership and are too weak to hold people accountable when their actions put a gun into the hands of criminals. So I have a prediction and a path for how we will reduce gun violence substantially and save a lot of lives. We'll do this in a uniquely American way. It will not involve gun bans. It'll be without violating the Second Amendment. And it'll be through applying values and ideas that the vast majority of gun owners hold. These are values I understand as a native Kentuckian. My father had a hunting rifle, my granddad a revolver. And I love to hear the story from my great-grandma Bessie tell about how she shot someone who was trying to rob her tavern. But I also know how it feels to be on the wrong side of a gun. My very first job was as a social worker working on domestic violence. Very first week, I was threatened with a gun investigating an incident of domestic violence. So before I talk about the very specific path, policy path, that will take us to what I think will be 30 to 50 percent reductions in our murder rates. That's four to 6,000 fewer homicides a year when you account for population growth over the next two decades, but also reduce a lot of suicides. Think about how we dramatically reduce a leading cause of death for young people, for teenagers in America. In 1978, 10,000 American teens were killed in motor vehicle crashes. But today, our teens have a 69% lower risk of dying in a car crash. How did we do that? Did we ban cars? Did we ban alcohol? No. What we did, we increased the legal drinking age from 18 to 21. We increased standards for getting a driver's license. We increased standards for uh, sober driving. We increased the risk that if you drove drunk, you would get caught and face stiffer penalties. And importantly, we also held people accountable if they sold or gave alcohol to underage youth. And finally, we did with we, we often do to make advances in public health. We applied the best available technology, stuff like airbags. So I think we can apply these same principles today of higher standards, more accountability, and smart application of technology to reduce gun violence. So the fir first type of policy I want to talk about will address the problem that we have now where 
there are many not so law-abiding people who can legally own guns and actually care, carry them about anywhere they'd like. What we should do is we should prohibit gun ownership if you've had multiple convictions for any offense involving violence, alcohol abuse, or drugs, if you've had a restraining order for domestic violence, or if you've uh, committed an offense as a juvenile, uh, a serious offense as a juvenile. Now, these, don't, these prohibitions don't need to be lifelong. People and circumstances change. So if you go for five or 10 years without committing violence and crime, you could potentially regain that right to own a gun. Now, a lot of people say very skeptically, and I understand it, what's the use of all this? Criminals are always going to get guns anyway. They don't, they don't obey these laws. Where's this idea come from? It comes from the, uh, actually a bit of truth. The bit of truth is criminals tend to get their guns through an underground market. Okay? But how do those guns get into that underground market? Do they sprout from the ground, drop from the sky? No. The next two policy types I'm going to talk about address the two major conduits, the channels of how guns get into this illicit market. The first deals with licensed gun dealers. Now, most licensed gun dealers uh, obey the law and are not a problem for public safety. However, a very small percentage are major, major contributors to this pipeline into the underground gun market. A single gun dealer can put thousands of guns into this pipeline, into the hands of criminals. Think how that might affect a city's homicide rate, or even a region's homicide rate. So, gun dealers have the power, licensed gun dealers have the power to prevent or promote illegal transfers of guns. They can do it in a variety of ways, through straw purchases within their store, or colluding with traffickers, or even by not really taking me measures to prevent theft. So what they do is going to depend on whether our policies hold them accountable. I have a great example of this. Back in 1999, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF, published a report. This report identified the nation's leading sellers of guns, retail sellers of guns, that were later used in crime. Top of that list, number one, the little gun shop um, near Milwaukee called Badger Guns and Ammo. Within days of the ATF publishing this report, noting them as the number one seller of crime guns, the owners of that gun shop announced that they would voluntarily take measures to prevent their guns from getting into the hands of criminals. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe what happened next. Immediately, immediately, there was a 77% drop in the flow of guns from that gun shop to criminals in Milwaukee. A huge citywide impact. However, in 2003, the United States Congress passed a law to protect gun dealers like Badger Guns and Ammo that had hundreds of their guns used in crime. This law said that the ATF could not release, share publicly any information connecting gun dealers to the crimes committed with the guns that they sold. They even pr prohibited the ATF from using that data when they were making decisions about whether to revoke a gun dealer's license. So what do you think happened back in Milwaukee with Badger? I'll tell you. Immediately following the passage of this law protecting them, the flow of guns from that gun shop to the criminals went up by 200%. I wondered whether they sent Congress a thank you note. By 2005, they ascended back to being the nation's number one seller of crime guns. So how do we deal with this? The sec second policy type has two parts. First part is simple. 
release public information about the safety records of gun dealers. This would create a huge incentive for safer business practices. The second part is also fairly simple. We're going to require gun dealers to apply things that most retail businesses already have. We're going to require them to have security cameras. We're going to require computerized sales and inventory records. Additionally, with really not much trouble, you can apply a, a computer program to simply flag someone who's coming to purchase a firearm, and that person had previously had a, purchased a gun that was used in a crime. That might tell a gun dealer, you might want to use caution with this sale, okay? Anti-theft anti measures would help as well as part of these requirements. These modest changes have powerful impact, and we have an example of that. New York City sued several gun dealers that were caught making illegal sales. And most of these gun dealers signed agreements to apply these same, same safer business practices in their gun shops. Well, we were able to look at records from those gun shops and guns recovered in New York City. And we found that there was an 82% reduction, 82% reduction in the likelihood that guns sold by those shops would end up involved in crime in New York City. So the other major conduit for guns into this underground market comes from a really illogical aspect of our gun law. We require background checks and record keeping if you purchase your gun from a licensed dealer, but we exempt some purchasers if they're buying a gun from a private citizen. What a favor we are doing to criminals and gun traffickers with that measure. I think we'll come to our senses and close that gap in our law. Studies show that the, that policy does, adopting that policy does reduce diversions of guns to criminals. I think the best way to do this is through a purchaser permitting system where you apply for a, uh, to a law enforcement agency to get a permit to purchase. Missouri had such a law in place for many, many years. However, its lawmakers decided to repeal that law in 2007. Well, guess what happened? The diversions of guns to criminals immediately jumped twofold. Gun homicide rates went up 25%. Clearly, that law was preventing gun homicides before it was repealed. So this is a common sense measure that saved lives. Now, the fourth type of policy gets to applying new technology. Now, we don't know what's in store in the years ahead of us, what technological advances might be there. But I can tell you right now that there's technology we have available that we are not using and can use that would significantly reduce gun violence. Now, I'm sure anyone who's ever watched the cop show knows that when police recover bullet casings from a crime scene, they can they have computer programs that help them look at the patterns to try to connect that ballistic evidence to the gun that fired it. Isn't that great? The problem, however, is most, in the vast majority of shootings, police don't recover a gun. So, there's now technology available that manufacturers can apply when they're making guns to put unique codes that gets stamped on the ammunition when it is fired. They're referred to as micro stamps, okay? And record, connect that to the information gun manufacturers already have to record, make, model, caliber, serial number. ATF can use that information when a bullet casing is recovered from a, a crime scene make the connection using the information that the manufacturers are collecting, 
and presto, you, can, you know from a crime scene who purchased the gun used in that shooting. Not only would this put a lot of violent criminals in jail, it would also serve as a huge deterrent to violent crime as well as gun trafficking. So, we're in nation's capital political gridlock. gridlock. What's the likelihood that this will happen? It seems dim. But we saw rapid changes when we think about uh, sentencing of nonviolent drug offenders. It used to be political suicide to do that. Now we see bipartisan support for, for going in that direction. I think we're going to change these laws mainly because gun owners usually get their way when it comes to gun policy in America. If you look at the policies that I just discussed, overwhelming support by Americans' gun owners. Over 80% 80, 80 support comprehensive background checks, 70 to 80% approve of those higher standards for legal gun ownership, and nearly 60 to 80 percent approve of greater accountability measures for gun dealers. So we'll do this when the silent majority of gun owners find their voice and call out for sanity in our gun laws to prevent deaths that are very preventable. Senator Joe Manchin, the U.S. Senator from West Virginia, who had an A rating from the National Rifle Association, authored the bill to close the background check problem, close that gap. What he said following Newtown was, I'm a proud outdoorsman and hunter, but this doesn't make sense. I think Senator Manchin is right. I think we can increase our standards, enhance accountability, and do so in ways that the vast majority of gun owners support. We'll do this in a uniquely American way. Liberty that was of liberty within law. Thank you.